Very welcome to the first in our present series of Life Stories. Our guest tonight has been at the centre of the creative and cultural industries in Ireland and indeed across the globe for many years. She's been by turns performer, producer, director, entrepreneur and is presently involved in guiding policy across most of the creative industries. She's also been Businesswoman of the Year and Entrepreneur of the Year on a number of occasions. Ladies and gentlemen, Maya Dard. Well, you're very welcome. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Now, in a sense, it's almost coming home because you were born in Donegal. But interesting for me, a part of Donegal that I'm not sure whether it is Donegal or not, Pettigal. <clears throat> well, actually, the real truth uh, is I was born in Enniskillen, County Fermanagh. All right. <laughs> In the hospital <laughs> and smuggled back across the border like a pound of butter <laughs> when I was a day or two old. I've seen you um, on occasion saying that the Donegal aspect has been crucially important to your life over the years because there is something about a Donegal um, ethos or a Donegal way of life that was instilled in you at a very early age. Yes, I think it is particular to the county, but it is also particular to the era. Um, in that uh, generationally, my parents were primary school teachers. So the primary school teachers, they were the first in their family to be educated. So in those days, they did everything through Irish, and they had a certain standard. And I suppose that's what you grow up with. So whether it was Donegal, particularly, or the era, or a melt of both. Is it a work ethic? Is it a belief in yourself? Is it, what is that ethic that was instilled in you during those childhood years? My father had um, <clears throat> two sayings. One was, always be on time. And the second one was, and always do an honest day's work. And I think he told a story about my grandfather who had come back from the States and he had a number of bogs in, uh, in around on low and he took a few fellas off the dole queue to go out and he said, would you like to dig the bogs? And they said, well, we don't have any shovels. And he said, I'll buy you shovels. So he bought them shovels and he left them out in the field and he went back a couple of hours later to see the heads of the shovels broken and the men were gone. And he just couldn't understand it. I mean, I think there was a phenomenal work ethic in both my parents' families, out of need, necessity. Was it a happy childhood? Do you remember it being a happy childhood? Um, yes, it was. Um, it was. And I said, my mother was a very strong woman, and criticism featured very highly in our childhood years. Um, I suppose, in many ways, and I think as a result of that, we're all quite driven in the family. We've all been quite driven because we probably never felt good enough because you couldn't ever be good enough for her, but that was her way. And does that criticism create an atmosphere where you need to go away? You need to get away, and that helps to develop the career? Uh, there's no doubt. I mean... Uh, there's no doubt in so many ways. Uh, I mean, I, I rebelled from a very early age. I didn't make things terribly easy on them at all. And I wasn't even sure what it was I was rebelling against, actually. It was just I wanted to go left and they wanted me to go right. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think it was. I, I broke away early. I broke away early emotionally. I broke away early romantically. I broke away in every way. Um, I became independent very early on in life, like I'm talking 15, 16. Right. And at what point, 
without getting too far into the story, do you realize I need to make this right? I need to patch this up. I need to, to solve that rift. Um, it was never, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a rift as such. It was just a massive difference of opinion. Um, and, Is that not and, a rift? <laughs> no, no. No, because within the difference of opinion, we understood each other. And, and they respected, in a way, they, they did respect my difference. They didn't understand it. Uh, but, they, I mean, they were very clever because, I mean, I started, uh, I, I don't think I've actually ever told this story before, but I'm going to tell it now. At 15 years of age, I went out with my teacher. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm not was, going to interrupt here. I'm just going to let it run. <laughs> he was 22. And uh, I was in a convent girls' school. Um, that relationship went on for five years. And when it, I mean, it's, it's extraordinary now looking back on it because as a parent myself, I mean, who would let their 15-year-old daughter walk out with a 22-year-old man when she was still in a gym slip? Who was teaching you? Who was, well, he was a French and Spanish teacher. He didn't teach me directly, but he did teach me drama extracurricular activity. <laughs> Why make a drama out of a crisis? The nuns knew. The every, nuns knew. Oh, the nuns knew. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting because it may have been something about a presumption of innocence. They knew about it, but, but presume that we still lived in innocent times. Of course, of course, because those were the days where they would uh, come between you when there was a, a dance in the school hall and they'd say, leave room for the Holy Spirit. Yes. <laughs> I'm not going to go any further with that. Uh, we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk about that later. I think we'll talk about that later. Um, uh, but that does pose the question that clearly you were given enough room to make decisions for yourself by, by your family, even though they may not have agreed with what you're doing. There's absolutely, there's no doubt about that. And in fact, I think, um, you know, the two things that they say you should give children are roots and wings. They were actually very good at both of those things, even though um, I, I'm not at all as good uh, on the parenting at giving the wings to my own boys as they were, because when I asked my mother when that five-year relationship that's found very critical adolescent years and, and, and growing up years in my life, I said, why, when I told her it was all over, she said, I'm, I'm really happy to hear that. And, and I said, well, why didn't you intervene? And she said, Moya, if we had tried to, you know, intervene, it may have gone the wrong way. It clearly didn't interfere with your studies because um, you could have gone to UCD but made a decision not to do so. Now, that is an incredibly... It would be a brave decision now, but at the period we're talking about, it was an incredibly brave decision. Um, I, I don't... Know. Yes, it, it may have been. I just had this sense... I have two, two sisters older than me. They were... They started school when they were three, so they went to UCD when they were 16, and they had their degree when they were 19. In those days, you could do a three-year degree, and you, you could start at 16. I came a year or two later, and I watched them go out on their little Honda 50 from Clontarf to UCD every day, and it never seemed to interest me. You know, they'd come back, and it just didn't... It didn't, I didn't want to go out to UCD on a Honda 50. And I spotted RTE across the road from UCD, and I thought, now that's much more interesting for me. Um, and, you know, again, I, it was a huge disappointment to my parents because education was everything to them. And uh, I think in despair, my mother at one stage said, if you don't want to um, go to UCD, would you not become a nurse? And I said, oh, God, no. I said, why? We well, said, you might marry a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> but it, getting that education, I'm presuming in the period we're talking about, wasn't just an education, it was a political decision as well. It was a way of escaping the politics of the time as well, if you could reach a certain educational dimension. Yes, um, the thing I really wanted to do, and I used to send away to two to third-level colleges, one was the Juilliard in New York, and the other was RADA. 
And I had, that was all I wanted to do. I used to actually just send away for their brochures. I mean, this was before the internet, before anything, just to watch that piece of paper fall in through the letterbox onto the floor that I could sit in some dark corner of the house and look at it and dream because it is all I wanted to do was to act. And the thought of being in an environment, that's why being here today was so, um, I mean, it's just so beautiful to walk through a creative arts building where students now can study music and dance and theater and it wasn't available in, for me in the early 70s. So where did you get the passion from? Because from what you're saying, you weren't involved in drama at school. Was there was there local drama group? I know I was. I I, um, I I remember actually. I remember the day that that my heart first really sang. I was eight years of age, and I had just moved from Don Donegal to Dublin uh, to Belgrove National School, which is famous Belgrove because the, uh, the girls and boys school, but the boys school had the very famous John McGahern as a teacher. It was that was the school that he was thrown out of. Mm. Um, but uh, we had a lovely teacher from Galway, Miss O'Regan, who had absolutely no interest in maths or anything to do with standard curriculum. All she wanted to do was to recite poetry. And she had us standing on the desks. And there was a moment, and we were reciting The Fiddler of Dooney by William Butler Yeats. And I just remember that moment and thinking, I don't know what this is, but this is it. This is it. And years later, um, when I, I suppose, matured and was able to piece the kind of weave of my life together in some shape or form in my head, I went to find her, only to discover that she had died at a very young age. And I kind of felt it was, I just never got to thank her, which is a sadness. So you make the decision not to go to UCD, you're going to be an actor, you're going to go yeah. out and do that. And then you didn't like it? No, no, I wasn't, I wasn't cut out for it at all. Um, it wasn't that I didn't like it as a form of expression, um, but what it didn't give me was the kind of control I wanted over my life. Um, not in a, in a very strong sense, but just, I really admire actors. I think the strength of an actor to go out there and to express yourself in that deep and meaningful way and to put yourself forward for rejection after rejection. Because the actors we know about are the stars, but there's a whole body underneath that little pinhead top who struggle, and struggle on very poor wages, and struggle with constant rejection. Um, I had a sense that for a woman, it was, for a it was going to be hard. It was going to be hard. So... Um, I spent a year with an educational theatre company, touring, and at the end of it, it really sorted me out, I'll tell you. I didn't want to do the fit-ups. Were you a good actor? Um, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I was, um, really. Uh, but I think now, I saw a production, um, that beautiful book by Joan Didion, uh, turned into a play, The Year of Magical Thinking. Vanessa Redgrave played it in the Dublin Theatre Festival a couple of years ago, and I went to see her. This magnificent statuesque woman who commanded the stage, and I thought, for the first time, I thought, I really regret not being an actor. And then I thought, it's not something a woman can go back to at 50, because I think it's about layers and layers of experience that make an actor great. Maybe I'm wrong. But it's interesting you say that it would be difficult for a woman in that industry to call it an industry, that mm. art. But you went into another one where I would have imagined it was even more male-dominated. You went into the media industries, you went into RTE. Mm. Now, you went in, I suppose, in a job that would have been expected of a woman. Mm. You know what, you went in as a secretary. Mm. But that wasn't what you were going to stay. You had your eyes somewhere else. So you were choosing a very male-dominated Space? I, I, um, <clears throat> I didn't look at it like that at all. I uh, went in there to earn some money to hopefully get into the ready wearing players. That was my short term and only ambition then at that stage. Because, um, and, uh, and then just life had a way of making decisions for me. Nothing was planned. It was all a bit haphazard, actually. Um, because Orti in those days... 
if you if you did a job half well, they offered you another one. <laughs> and that's what happened. <laughs> but RTE, I mean, you were in RTE as a presenter, mm -hmm. and then you go and try the theatre again for a while. Mm -hmm. Then you go to TV AM mm -hmm. as a presenter. But in between all of these, you keep coming back to RTE. It's played this crucial role almost in that early part of your life. It was my, um, it was my university. I mean, in, I, I was looking back on it. In four years, I went from secretary through to broadcasting assistant to production assistant. Uh, to getting my NUJ card and to presenting an arts program, all in a space of four years. So I suppose the sort of degrees that they have now in media and communications, I got through the training courses of RTE. Um, it's not, I mean, that's not available now to people um, anymore. How important is RTE, or indeed the BBC, any of those state broadcasters, how important are they within the broadcast landscape? I'm passionately committed to the whole concept of public service broadcasting. Um, I think that um, it's very difficult now, much harder now because of the landscape and the noise that's out there in terms of the number of channels and the competition and the commercial competition. So the public service end of RTE, they have to struggle hard with that because it doesn't bring ratings, it doesn't bring advertising, and they're competing in, in, that, in that landscape. So it's harder and harder, but I think that they, I mean, the archive of most lives for the last 50 years are on the shelves of RTE, all the stories. They're, they, they have wonderful material in their back catalogue. I mean, those who went out for the years and gathered the stories and made those beautiful programs, that's our history. And I often felt when I was working in RTE that I thought, I wonder if I went in, you know, if somebody went back and said, I want to see what 1984 was like, and they took a tape down off the shelf and looked at it, that they would get a sense of the political and social and economic history of our island. Mm -hmm. When you were going through that process with RTE, you tried the acting, it wasn't for you. Mm -hmm. You tried the presenting, and it wasn't for you, so you went into producer. Mm -hmm. And you used a phrase earlier where you said that you wanted to be in control of your own life. Mm -hmm. Seems to me you wanted to be in control full stop. You didn't want to be on the facing the camera with people telling you what to do. You wanted oh, to be no, telling the people that. what to do. I hated front of camera. I really did. I really hated it um, so much. Uh, I was really uncomfortable in that space. Um, and, I mean, the bit I liked was, you know, the, the off-camera interviewing. Um, I mean, I'd be much more comfortable interviewing you now than I am having you interview me. <laughs> I'll tell you that. You did that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I... Uh, you no, know, I, I think it is a sense of, it is, it, yes, it is that. It is that sense of managing an idea or telling a story and being the editor of that story and being able to shape that story in the way that you want to and that it's your judgment. That was important. That eventually became critical for me. So you like to be in control? Okay. Yes. <laughs> in that kind of job, it's not a nine to five job. It's not a kind of job where you um, can make decisions about what you're going to be doing next week and so on. How did you handle that work life balance? And there was no balance, it was all work um, in those days before I had children and even after, which was tricky. Um, you see, I don't ever, I never saw it as work. I never saw it as work, and it was amazing that I was getting paid for it. Um, I just loved it. I just loved it, and I never looked at the clock, and um, it never bothered me. It was, it was my passion. It was what I loved to do, and I was thrilled that I was in a place where I could. While you were doing... The, the jobs they were asking you to do, did you have in the back of your mind somewhere this notion that there's something special that I'm going to do? There, there, there's something that I need to do? Because you know where I'm going with this. I mean, was there always this thing that 
I need to do the big thing. In order to break through, I need to do the really big no, thing. No, I never thought that at all. Um, in fact, I, I, where I really wanted to and where I had been working, and it was, it was the place I, I really enjoyed, I was working in current affairs documentaries, and I had made a documentary on child sexual abuse. Um, and it was, a, it was 1991 or 92, and I had managed to f meet these three extraordinary women who've actually only just published a book now about their lives called Click Click, and it's number one in the in the, um, in the best-selling list at the moment. Um, and I managed to persuade them to tell their story in, in two camera, not as a hidden voice or a lit, you know, darkened shadow. So they came out, and that documentary was very well received, and I, it actually won me a number of awards. And I thought, this is where I want to be. I re this is my home. And I loved it. And then I got a phone call from the director of programs saying, we want you to go to entertainment. And I thought, oh, God, no. I don't want to go there. I'm really happy here. Um, but as you know, you're not, you know, you're not the absolute master of your own destiny when you're working in public service broadcasting. So he just said to me, look, I just want you to do this one job. And I said, OK. So it, it, within the industry at that time, anyway, was, is it, was entertainment looked on as kind of the poor relative? Well, it, it wasn't was, proper television? It was this sort of, it was, yeah, it was kind of song and dance. And I mean, it didn't, uh, you know, it was soft, probably. Um, and if you were a serious producer, you would have wanted to be in current affairs or drama. Mm. They were the kind of very serious areas, not really the song and dance world of entertainment. So what did you think about the entertainment sector when you were sent to work in it? How did, how did you see it? Well, I, I knew that it was what it was. It entertained people, and it also rated very highly, you know, that there was an audience for it. And I mean, they were the days where RT would put on a, a Red Hurley show or a Brendan Shine show um, and, and draw in a phenomenal audience. Um, so I suppose I also thought, because I was also a producer and a director, and I liked the idea of working with music, and I liked the idea of breaking down a song and working out the camera script. I found that, you know, enjoyable. So, so I, I, I thought I did it. And you're getting settled in, and then in 1995, the Eurovision Song Contest comes to Ireland. Mm. And is there a light bulb moment and you think, I know what we'll do during the interval? <laughs> yeah, well, no, uh, yes and no. Um, it, it happened at that the beginning, the seeds of that were sown earlier, and they were sown in the National Concert Hall at a night that I had nothing to do with. I was simply in the audience. Um, it was a cage of fields, celebrating the cage of fields uh, in Mayo. And um, on that, that night, actually, all the ingredients of river dance were there, but in separate sections in that John McColgan, my work partner and life partner, was producing the show, RTE were covering it, Bill Whelan was writing some of the music, and Michael Flatley did a solo dance with the Chieftains, and Jean Butler and another part of the stage came on with Colin Dunn. And I was sitting in the audience that night, and I thought, God, that dance is really interesting. That's just really, I hadn't seen anything like it. The athleticism that had been brought to the Irish dance by Michael and by Jean separately that night. So I wanted to get back into documentaries and I um, started to talk to Michael Flatley about making a documentary on the international influences on Irish dance. And that's where I was when I got the call to do the Eurovision. And is it your vision or is it the collaborative vision that brings together River Dance on that night? Um, the work is collaborative, definitely, there's no doubt. I mean, I don't think it's, I think I put together the pieces, I, I, I cast it. But then the fusion of the creative thinking grew the piece. Because for, for students working in the creative mm. arts area, it's becoming increasingly clear that 
collaboration is the key to these successes, irrespective of how individually talented you might be mm. yourself? Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, if you, you know, if you say, okay, the ingredients are Michael Flatley, Gene Butler, Bill Whelan, you know, a Broadway chorus line and simple black dresses. I'm not a composer. I'm not a choreographer. So if you hand that idea over to the wrong composer and the wrong choreographer, that idea might die on the vine. If you give it to the right choreographer and the right composer, then it breathes. There's energy and life and passion. When you were watching it being rehearsed, were you aware that Irish culture was going to shift on its axis? No, no. Um, not at all, actually. I knew it was very good. When I first heard the music, I thought this is probably one of the most perfectly structured pieces of music I've ever heard in the way the mixed rhythms come in and the way it builds. Um, I, I, I mean, as it, I was exec producing the entire event, so uh, I was busy, you know, and I look, you know, it, I just knew it was going to be very good. And I think it is in everything about writing a piece of music or telling a story or writing a book. You don't, you do it quietly. You maybe do it in isolation or you do it with a small team. But the missing ingredients, the audience, the reader, the viewer, and something only comes to life when it has an audience. And when it goes out that night, live, and you've just seen the response, do you sit down and say, that part of my life is over and a new part of my life is over. Did, were you aware that... No. No? No. No, not at that moment. No, that at moment. Maybe I'm just So what was slow. the moment? <laughs> what, what, what was the moment? What was the moment where you knew? Um, look, I mean, that piece was six minutes and 40 seconds. And I knew, it, I mean, obviously the response was phenomenal. And I was really proud. I was really proud of everybody involved in it. I was really proud for the country. I was... I really felt that's a job well done, terrific. And then I got another call to say, would you ever turn that six minutes and 40 seconds into a TV show for Christmas? And I thought, oh God, okay. <laughs> I just wanted a holiday. And um, I, I thought, hmm, not, no, okay. I thought, no, I said, I think we'll do something else. We'll maybe make it a stage show and you can cover that. Because obviously it's very different creating something within a TV studio or creating something on a, on a, on a prosa arch for, for stage. So um, that was the big, the, like the big challenge was turning six minutes and 40 seconds into a two-hour show. Because, you know, there were many people who said, okay, that Irish dancing thing is fantastic, but who's going to watch two hours of it? And, uh, and I think that's where the real creative challenge came uh, because there were very high expectations and, you know, to disappoint would have been horrendous. So um, we just, you know, there was, there was a very intense period of creative collaboration and we realized then that we wanted to probably go big with this and that we needed to bring in other cultural influences because as a composer, Bill felt that there may not have been enough color on the palette for him to create the music for, for two hours out of the, the Irish dance idiom. Mm. But I still feel, I watched a, a small clip of, a document, of a, an interview you did for a nationwide program in 2007, and you said that it was luck that it happened. And it seems to me you're almost still saying that it was luck. I feel there had to be a moment where you knew that it was river dance to production, but there was going to become river dance, the cultural phenomenon, which was going to raise Ireland's culture present globally, presence globally, just hugely. Um, you see, I, I mean, there are two things there, and we we'll just look at the luck. I mean, you know, there, there, there's a huge amount of work and thought and effort and money and time went into creating both the original six minutes and 40 seconds and the two-hour show. Um, there was a, f a moment in our social, economic, political, cultural history in the early 1990s that was ready. 
And I think things have a moment in time. An idea has a life. And there are many good ideas, but actually it needs, they need oxygen. And, and the oxygen was available to that idea at that moment in time. And it sort of probably heralded or was the beginning of that awful phrase that the Celtic tiger. Mm -hmm. But it was, the, it was at the very cusp of a new energy. And whether we led that, followed it, or were part of it, I don't know. Um, but there was a moment in time. And lest we forget, that moment in time meant that 100 million people in 32 countries and four continents saw it, and it was the first Western production ever to play in China. So it's a fairly phenomenal moment. Yes, it, it, it is. And I mean, there aren't many producers either who um, have a captive audience of hundreds of millions watching a show. Like, I mean, growing up in Dublin and working as a producer for RTE, you'd be lucky to have a couple hundred thousand people looking at your work. So in the back of my mind, I was aware of that. I was absolutely aware that the, the reason I took the job as producer of the Eurovision was not because I wanted to produce the Eurovision, but because I wanted to do this interval act that I had spinning around in my head. Do you like river dance? <laughs> <laughs> do you, Paul? I'm ambivalent about it because I understand its importance, but I'm not sure whether I like it as a piece of art entertainment. I think it, it questions everything that we know about the tradition of Irish dancing. And I'm not sure whether that questioning brings us to a good point, because the next thing I was going to ask you was, is it responsible for the wigs and the orange and all the stuff that goes on in Irish dancing? Oh, quite the, quite the opposite. Quite the opposite. I mean, I, I'm absolutely shocked at that. I don't know where that's come from. Because that is a discourse that River Dance was being responsible for that. Well, I mean, uh, that discourse has absolutely no basis in any uh, truth or, or, or theory or practice. Because if you look at what River Dance did, it stripped away all of that. The original Riverdance line, the women were dressed in plain black dresses to the knee. They didn't even have cummerbund. There wasn't a Celtic image on their body. And that was the modernity of it. I have no idea where this other nonsense has come from. I ain't responsible for it. <laughs> well, you, you, you've kind of answered... <laughs> You've kind of answered my next question because I was going to ask you, what do you think of the wigs and all the kind of stuff? Um. I think it's a travesty. I mean, look, I, I, I loved the, 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 you know, the kind of affectionate memory of the beautiful bonnie and the hand-stitched embroidery and the white socks and, and, and where the mothers used to curl the hair. And there was a, a really natural, simple... Um, conservative sweet beauty about all of that. That was there, and then there was river dance, and now there's this other thing. I mean, I think it must have something more to do with the X Factor of Big Brother than it has river dance. Okay. <laughs> I'll take that. However, it's interesting that you're mentioning X Factor and, and, and Big Brother and so on, because it's as though river dance is a platform which allows you to develop for want of a better way to put it, this huge entrepreneurial empire. Again, is there a moment where you think, this is my moment to start expanding? Because there's this great thing they talk about in, in the creative industries now, the long tail, that when you make something, if you make a program, the program's not important, it's all the stuff you sell on its long tail, the CDs and the merchandising and so on. Did you realize at that moment that that was possible with Riverdance? <clears throat> Riverdance grew out of public service broadcasting. Um, the, and this sounds a bit pure and a bit, uh, and a bit like a Catholic schoolgirl, but 
Well, we know that you weren't good at that, so <laughs> <laughs> we've already been there. <laughs> the drive was simply to do good work, to do something that we could be happy with and proud of. The fact that it spun into this extraordinary industry and, and I had to learn the skills of business pretty swiftly and sharply and smartly was an after. I, you know, I mean, I was chasing it, really. I was running to catch up. But you were chasing the programming and the quality yes. and the art, yes. without sounding pretentious about it. Anything that happens after that is peripheral. It's a byproduct. But it allows you to do more stuff then. Um, well, if you're existing in an environment where there is a market for product and you have something that people really want, I think it would be rather silly to sit in a corner and say, we're not changing, we're not moving, we're not going to do the Riverdance app or the Riverdance game or whatever it is um, that's there. And I think that we've always felt, um, the three of us, Bill, myself and John, very strongly, once there's a market for it and we maintain the standard that we are all comfortable with, we will keep it going. But if you chase the money, is it likely you'll be successful or do you have to chase the quality of the product? Um, look, it, 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 it's, I, don't, I, I can't really answer that, only to say that I'm, I am only driven by the quality of the work that I'm doing. And the fact that it has been phenomenally financially successful was not the driving ambition uh, at all. And I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not sure. I mean, you know these things when you ask young people now what they want to be? They say they want to be famous. Yes. And you say, but what do you want to do? And it's the same thing. I want to be rich. I mean, it's a kind of a... Uh, you know, I, I mean, to me, it's about every day, getting up every day, what you do with your day, how you engage with people. Um, that's what it's about. Is there a point where river dance becomes an albatross, actually? You can't escape it when you want to move on to the next thing? Um, well, I, I, I think, yes. I think... Um, because you've done, within that partnership, many... Excellent things. You've got the latest production, the, the, the Schoenberg and the, and the Bologna yeah. production, which was in Broadway and is now in Paris. You've done the documentaries. You've done um, a number of new programs for RTE. But yet they're not talked about in the same vein as Riverdance. So there's this kind of albatross that you can't get, get rid of, in a sense. Yeah, but I suppose, um, I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's an okay albatross, isn't it? <laughs> it's a pretty good albatross, yeah. It's a, it's a pretty good albatross, yes. We you know, I mean, I know what you're saying, and I think it does, it does bring a fear. It does bring with it a fear. Look, I know, sitting here tonight, I will never have another moment as great as I had that night on the 30th of April, 1994. Or when we opened in Radio City Musical, or in Beijing, I don't think that in in my lifetime again, that I could be involved in the creation of a piece that displaced as much air. Um, but I would hope that I could continue to do work. And so it's the standard I set for myself. Other people have expectations and the media have expectations and all of those kind of things. And, and there is a fear, there is a fear. And of course they say, oh God, that's hopeless. She's, you know, a one hit wonder. Um, I dare them. <laughs> I dare them. But the point about that is you don't need to do it anymore. Why, why do you keep doing it? You don't need to do it. Need in what way? Well, in terms of what people would see as being their, their ambition in life to kind of get comfortable and to have done something which people looked at and were proud of and thought was good. And you've done all that. And, and now you can do the things... I was going to say you could do the things you want to do, but you're going to tell me this is what you want to do. No, I mean, strangely, you know, I mean, and this sounds like a really kind of strange thing to say, but I don't think um, 
I don't think I've done my best work yet. I know that's a really strange thing to say because I don't think my best work is as a producer. I think it may be in some other creative vein. Um, and I think it's, it's just about the layers of that, that, and that kind of interwoven thing. I mean, everything that I've learned on my journey to date um, has been extraordinary. And I feel that it's, it's coming to a moment that will fuse something else for me entirely different that will probably satisfy me creatively more. Because sometimes as a producer, um, you know, your job is to pull together the creative team, the bones of the idea, and the money. And that's what your job is. And I think maybe I'm getting, I, I kind of want to be more central to the creative development. So what is this creative space? I, 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 you know, I don't know. There's a few things, but maybe writing. I don't know. Maybe, maybe being a little bit closer to what's on the page. Um, because maybe that's... You know, I think everybody wants to change and grow and develop. And, uh, and, and perhaps, um, perhaps I've, I've, I've done this for long enough, even though I am going to do one or two other shows and then maybe maybe uh, hang that part of my life on some hook. So do you find yourself being dragged away to write something or put something down? Well, and no. that's happening more I mean, I'm even, I'm even kind of, I don't even really want to talk about it, actually, because, you know, it's just forming. We'll watch this space. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when we talk to students about entrepreneurship, we teach it. And, and we, we, we kind of create modules whereby mm. students can teach. Can you teach entrepreneurship? Or is it something that either you have or you haven't got? <clears throat> I, I think you can teach the building blocks that are required to support an entrepreneur. But I'm not sure there's that, there's that little spark. Um, it's that, 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 that risk-taking, um, driven ability that it's, is it ingrained in the person? Um, I, don't, I think it probably is. I would have loved had somebody taught me some of that actually earlier in life because I might have been more equipped. So that's why it's wonderful that you are teaching those courses. But it is a two-edged sword because you have that thing where you can teach people the mechanics but you can't teach them the passion of it. That it has to be something which you put the mechanics with the passion. And then that takes off somehow. But I made a lot of mistakes, and maybe had I had a little bit more um, of the formal training, I mightn't have made those mistakes. You mentioned the new technology, mm -hmm. the river dance apps and so mm -hmm. on. And part of the, the modern kind of notion is that these technologies are going to wipe out the old forms of entertainment. Where, where, do, you, where do you stand on that? Oh, I don't think so. I don't think, I think live entertainment has been around forever. I don't think. I think the experience that people have, I think the shape and form of it will change. I mean, I think more and more now the question people ask when they're going into theater is, how long is it? I think we are getting less kind of able to sit for two or three hours in the one space. And the form of theater now that is much more interesting to people is like it's, it's judged by the yard, 90 minutes, no interval. I'll be home or I'll go to the Italian restaurant and I'll have penny or a breath and a glass of wine and I'll be home by midnight. That's the way it's measured now. Yeah. Um, so I think that will change. But I don't think that um, I, I, there is nothing to beat the live experience. And how do you feel about the X Factors, for example, that kind of program? Which has become, I, I, and I'm going to show my age here, it's, it's the modern era's generation game. Isn't it? Opportunity yeah. knocks, yeah. 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 Huey Green. Yeah. Kind of Saturday night family entertainment. People um, have, have X Factor parties before they go out. The I think it's, it is, as the Americans would say, a phenomenon. Do I like it? Mm -hmm. Um... I don't like the manipulation. Um, but that's what people watch it for, really, isn't it? They, they watch to see people embarrassing themselves. Uh, I, I don't mind people embarrassing themselves, but I have an issue with people who have clearly got serious issues being exposed. I hope they're doing that less now. 
recently you've moved into a kind of area where you you work on a number of bodies and committees to try and develop policy around a number mm -hmm. of areas to mm -hmm. try and acting as a mentor, if you like, for, mm. for people coming through in these areas. Is that still part of the hunger? I mean, we're talking about Steve Jobs there, there the great Apple guru who died last week, mm. and he had this motto where he said, mm. stay hungry, stay foolish. Is it a hunger with you, or do you feel that, without sounding too grand about it, you have a responsibility, given your time in the industry and your knowledge of it, to do that? Um... I don't think it's I don't think it's either a hunger or a sense of responsibility it's just who I am and uh, I love working with I, I, I like to to work with younger artists to see what they're doing to be in touch to be involved and um, to support where possible um, and uh, and it's just it's a way of life really um, and I mean, there are, I've sat on tons of arts boards, and some of them have bored the life out of me. I mean, really, you'd want to, you know. Um, and I'm not really a committee person, and I have to, I have to work hard to sit at a, around a board table, boardroom table. I don't, you know, um, it doesn't. I, it's not an easy place for me to be. But, but, um, but I, but I know that. Um, that I suppose there are things that I can do to support. How do you relax? Um, <clears throat> I, I run. <laughs> I, I'm hoping to do a half marathon soon. I'm not going to do a marathon. I love to. I love running. I love running in the, on beaches and wide open spaces. I love to read, and my passion is cooking. I love to cook. So uh, with some really nice music on and uh, the smell of bread baking in the oven and that is heaven for me nostalgic is it trying to, to grasp again that those pedigal years that kind of no I think it's aging <laughs> well, I didn't want to say that but <laughs> you call it nostalgia I call it aging <laughs> you can say that I can't <laughs> so what next for Maya Doherty um well, we're working on a number of new projects. We're working with the BBC on a um, drama series. We have the rights to the John Banville books that he wrote under the pseudonym Benjamin Black. So the BBC are co-producing with us three one-hour dramas, which will be, be interesting. So, um, and also developing a stage show, a play with music on the life of the Clancy brothers, being written and going to be directed by that young, talented uh, director, Alan Gilson, and writer. It's his first writing project, actually, for stage. And uh, we're also developing a new dance show with a different flavor, but it is essentially a music and dance show. And we've pulled together a lovely creative team, Joseph O'Connor, the, the um, Irish writer, who's very musical. So it's lovely to write with a liter to work with a literary writer who is also a musician, particularly when he's putting the concept together for a new, sh new dance show, and a young composer called Brian Byrne, who's from Navan but lives in Los Angeles. So we hope to, um, I suppose, open that in the autumn of 2013. That's the plan at the moment. If you had to choose the thing that you've done that you're most proud of, what would it be? Oh, you know, I don't think like that. Honestly, it's kind of, I don't have those thoughts. Um, uh, you know, and I don't want to give that awful sloppy answer. Having my children was the proudest moment of my life. But it may you know, have been. But it was, <laughs> yes. Well, it was. But, I mean, um, you see, we were not allowed to have Pride growing up. It was seen as a really, really dirty word. Hmm. So some of the young people in this audience or some of the young people from I don't see many young the School people. of Creative Arts. <laughs> they're all young. Behave yourselves, they're all young. <laughs> and they come and knock on your door or stop you tonight and say, what advice would you give me? What would you say to them? Oh, follow your dream. 
follow your passion. Listen, listen to the advice of others, but, but go ultimately with your own instinct. I think the times in life where we don't listen to our own inner voice is the times we go wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, Marta. Thank you. All right. <laughs>